And she was so head and shoulders above pretty much everybody at the whole school, probably everybody in the whole city, that she was one of those people who you just know. You just, this person, as long as she has the inner strength and the discipline, she's going to make it, period. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Ongoing conversation between two expats living abroad in Rome from our two different perspectives. I'm here for a short time, only here a year. Tiffany is here a long time. Been here almost 10 years, and who knows if she's ever leaving. Who knows indeed. And sometimes when you move abroad, you have to give things up to gain the experience of living abroad. That's probably why a lot of people don't do it, even though they feel like they want to. Or maybe they feel like they don't want to because they'd have to give up too much. So today we're roughly in our heads titling this episode, The Ones That Got Away, The Dreams You Gave Up When You Moved Abroad. (laughs) Let's start with you, because I know that you gave up a very important job to move here. And when you first were talking about moving here with your husband, you assumed or you had a feeling that this job was going to be kept for you or you were going to be able to take a sabbatical and come back and the job would be there. And after deciding that you were going to move, you found out that that wasn't the case. That's right. I know. A lot of people, that would stop them in their tracks right there. But I remember when, I think it was before you actually moved here, or maybe shortly after, and I said something to you like, you know, maybe if you had known that you were going to lose that job, you wouldn't have come. So maybe it's good that you didn't know in advance, because maybe you were supposed to come, and this is what was supposed to happen. And you said you thought the same thing. Yeah, I do. I uh, It's interesting, because I had held the same job at uh, a local NPR station, for almost nine years, I think. And I'd been at the radio station in some capacity or another for 11. So it was a big commitment. And I was also um, working very hard at hosting and doing interviews and was very much hoping to make a um, permanent transition from being a producer solely into a producer host, (coughs) which I kind of already was, but I wanted to get more into the hosting and less into the being in charge of it of a show producing aspect so yeah and and when this opportunity arose Derek my husband was in between things he had just gotten a master's degree and he was applying for jobs but he hadn't found one yet not the right one anyway we had no pets except one fish did you flush him no the very last person I interviewed I'm kidding by the way I would never flush him he was a perfectly good fish I know you wouldn't no the very last person I ever interviewed not ever interviewed but last person I interviewed in the field (laughs) where you go on location I somehow mentioned this that I'm leaving and that I have this fish and he's like what kind of fish is it and I said uh it's a betta fish (laughs) and he says my wife and I were just talking about getting a betta fish serendipity synchronicity that is synchronicity right there i was gonna say serendipity but it's more yes so i said well i have a fish you could have for a while but if it survives i want it back and he agreed to take care of it for the year and as far as i know it survives but the last time i sent him an email he didn't write me back Uh oh but i did tell him that it's okay it's a fish if it dies that's what fish do they live and they die and it's unpredictable kind of like us very much like us <laughs> that's not, so profound <laughs> that's not good that's not good there we're talking about we're talking about giving up dreams not the death. ultimate giving up of dreams <laughs> your own death um <laughs> so my fish might be dreaming of me never coming back as far as i'm concerned your fish might be sleeping with the fishes yeah my fish probably doesn't remember what happened just a second ago and again he just forgot what happened just that last second so anyway Fish aside. So the only thing that's really holding us in Seattle is my job. And I loved my job. And I loved my coworkers. It was a hard place to get employment. I worked as an intern for two years trying to get in there in the first place. And so that was a big decision. It was a big decision to say, this is done, at least for now. 
I can imagine. I mean, you had so much security. I mean, you weren't just giving up on a dream. You were giving up on a steady job, which takes a lot of courage. And I was working really hard to get those interviewing positions, make the next step into something different. And so I had to give that up and just say, well, I guess that's not going to be the way of it. I'm not going to become the next host of a show <laughs> on this station. I'm going to stop fighting this fight and working so hard on this, and I'm going to go do something radically different. Well, I think sometimes that's what it takes, though, to make a big leap. You might not be leaping in the exact direction that you thought you were going to, but I think sometimes if you're pushing towards something and it's not working, it's not working, or you're working really hard to towards something and you're your effort isn't being appreciated or so, I don't know the details I'm just inventing but you sometimes do need to make a radical change and that might actually push you you think at the time you're oh my gosh I'm never going to get that a job like that again well actually you might get something 10 times better that's so true that's so true but it was about giving up the dream at the moment that I felt like I was finally getting somewhere <laughs> No need to cough about this. Sorry. No, that I was finally getting somewhere and then just choosing to step away, which was in some ways kind of refreshing because it had been a long road. But giving up that dream or at least that directive path that I had was just marching along ever so steadily, honing these skills and pushing for the next level, for the next level, and just saying, okay, this is done. And that door closed and like you said I didn't know it was going to close I originally asked for a leave and that didn't work out a lot of things were changing at the station at the time so I, I understand why they chose not to do it but I was hoping that it would be that I would be gone for nine months and then I'd get to come back and rejoin all my favorite colleagues again and continue if, doing what we were doing as if not a day had passed exactly you just had had an amazing nine months in Rome but what I said to you when I found out that you were leaving that job I hope that you also are feeling is that maybe there's something better waiting for you and it could even be they say oh you know what we are lost without you please come back it could be that and we're going to promote you or it could be something completely different a completely different station a completely different city who knows a different position yeah what's so interesting about actually stepping off of the plans the security like anything in life, I think it just makes you realize that the way that things are going doesn't need to be the way things are going. That even if you're in a job that you really love, you can still choose to move overseas. And then when you get back, start looking around for something different. And you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, and I don't think you should discount the experience of living abroad. You know, you think, oh, I'm just pausing my career. I am going to have this big gap in my resume. But I don't I don't know. I would think that employers wouldn't look at it that way. They would see uh, an experience like that as a bonus. Somebody who's going to bring a whole bunch of more experience to the table, having lived in a foreign culture and absorbed all of that. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't think of it as a pause. When I was thinking about quitting, I thought about it as a pause. But I actually feel like I've learned more about myself and about what I do well <laughs> in this year than any year. I guess that's part of having the time off to contemplate it, but it's also the time off to really work on the things that you really like doing. We all have days, even in jobs that we like, where you work on stuff all day that you don't really like. And so when you're step back, you have this moment to realize, what do I actually want? And you're not in the rat race anymore. That's so in that way, I don't think of it as a pause. If anything, if it's a pause, I would like it to extend for longer because I'm learning so much about myself. It's like taking a break in the middle of a really busy, productive day to meditate for a half an hour. You're technically not getting anything done, but actually the work that you are doing internally is probably going to pay off more than sitting in, at your desk for four hours desperately trying to get, quote unquote, work done. Mm -hmm. So what dreams did you have to give up to move here? Well, I should say that I did come here at a very different stage in my life. I moved here after finishing graduate school two years before I came here and I studied <laughs> excuse me it doesn't sound like it the way that I'm talking right now. we should also mention uh, since you're coughing is that you're just getting over bronchitis yes <laughs> so, so we'll forgive you <laughs> sorry about that and it's kind of psychosomatic that if I think about it it makes me cough all right I won't mention it again <laughs> okay okay so you get out of grad school so and I, you're coming here I get out of grad school I studied classical singing I had the dream as an adolescent of being an opera singer and I had amazingly supportive parents and I was 
given the opportunity to go to a wonderful conservatory and study with some amazing people and go to grad school. So I did not lack the opportunities that I wanted and I didn't lack the training. So I was very, very lucky in that respect. But um, I don't know if any of you out there listening have gone into the performing arts. It is very, very difficult and it is no way guaranteed that you are going to even be able to support yourself minimally doing that. And I realized, I'm not going to say I realized before I moved here, that wouldn't be quite right. Maybe deep down I did. But in those two years after grad school, which are for anybody, I think, getting out of school is a huge shock. It's hard enough when you actually have a job in your field, but when you have no job in sight that you feel you could possibly get, you have still so much to learn in it. I just felt so unprepared. And so I spent two years working some terrible day job, trying to have the energy to practice. And I'm not going to go into the whole sob story, but I will say that it wasn't really working for me. It wasn't, I wasn't going in that direction. I wasn't, I think if you're going to be any classical musician, but particularly a singer, you can tell whether it's going to happen or not at a certain point. I fought long, I fought a long time, I think, thinking, okay, this, I'm going through a difficult time, or I have this injury on my vocal cords, but I'm going to work it out, or this or that, or I just had a bad teacher. Or... But I have this friend who is a very successful opera singer, and I met her when I was a second year grad student, and she was a first year undergrad. And she was so head and shoulders above pretty much everybody at the whole school, probably everybody in the whole city, that she was one of those people who you just know you just this person as long as she has the inner strength and the discipline she's going to make it period obviously a little luck goes along with that and she is she's doing fabulously she is singing at the met she's singing all over europe all over north america asia she's she's very successful her name is Layla claire by the way just to give her a little plug she's amazing but she's one of those people who there was never any doubt i was not like that I have natural talent, but it wasn't at that level. Okay, in a sense, if you want to be really literal, I feel like I'm writing in my diary right now. Uh, <laughs> I guess I did give up on a dream because it was a dream, but so was, hey, so was becoming a ballerina, which was my dream when I was four. So I gave up on that too. Sometimes it's just a little bit of practicality that, 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 ha that tells you to do this. But I kind of realized that that wasn't, even if I wanted to spend the next 10 years working really hard at it, I didn't know that it's even going to make me happy at the end of that road. And that's if I was lucky enough to have a career, you know, which wasn't at all guaranteed. That period and that coming to that mental decision took a lot longer than just two years after grad school. And as I said, I still wasn't positive when I moved to Rome that, that I wasn't going to pursue singing. But I will say that having moved to Rome definitely made it less of a possibility for me. Was that because you weren't in the country legally at that time when you first got here? Partially, partially, but more because Italy is not a good country to start an opera career. I know I mentioned that in an earlier podcast. It's really not a good country. Even if you're an Italian, you're better off going to the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and even the United States. Italy is not, for many reasons, disorganization and funding problems. There's many problems, especially if you're not Italian, and even more especially if you don't have legal working papers to work in Italy. Here's a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. When you moved here, did you, in your heart of hearts, know that it was the, the step that was going to kill the dream? No, I didn't. In fact, I think I, I had a, a half connection with the, an important voice teacher that I had met through some Italian relatives. So when I very first moved here, like let's say the first year or two years that I lived here, I was actively singing. I was practicing all the time. I didn't end up singing with that teacher because I had a falling out with the family. Long story. I didn't have a voice teacher. I think that was a problem. But I was practicing and I was trying to at least keep up my chops, so to speak. But I didn't have the network here. I mean, it's now, I'm not saying I had a whole bunch of connections over in Boston, but I had gone to conservatory there, so I did know teachers, I did know other singers. And so moving to a completely different country without really any connection besides this sort of vague voice teacher who didn't work out was not a wise career move. 
So I think I may not have mentally made that decision, but my actions were showing me that I wasn't as serious about that career as I had been previously. So that means that possibly at the heart of it all, your dream of moving to Rome was stronger than your dream of becoming an opera singer. You know, I think it really might have been. It's it's hard to say that. It's hard because I dreamed of being an opera singer for so long from the time I was about 14. But I remember those last few years before moving here that all I could think about was moving to Italy. It was an obsession and how was I going to make it work and how was I going to do it and that got me way more excited than the idea of singing anyone who's had a major dream that is something that is very unlikely to come true that they work for for years and years can probably relate to the idea of your dream almost starts to become a negative thing because it becomes oppressive you know you start to feel like oh this is never going to happen and it just makes you miserable And so maybe I sort of was swapping it out for something new and something exciting. I don't know. I can't tell you. But it was definitely something that was a little more doable, I could say. I'm curious if because opera makes you think of Italy, were the two dreams tied together or were they two separate things? I think they were tied. I wrote a blog post about this, actually. I've always been a performer, but I didn't fall in love with opera until I saw the movie A Room with a View which is a very, very important movie in my life (laughs) because I simultaneously fell in love with Italy and then fell in love with opera. Because if you've seen A Room with a View, you know that the amazing Kiri Takanoa sings two Puccini arias in the soundtrack of that film. And one of them is in a very romantic scene, which every 12-year-old girl dreams of, which is being kissed on a hillside in Florence by a gorgeous young man. (laughs) So I think that these three things, the romanticism, the beauty of Italy as it is portrayed in that film, and the glorious opera singing of Kiri Takanoa and the beautiful music of Puccini all combined to, to really meld those things together. And I know that that film really made me want to live in Italy. And that was when that dream started. But the opera dream started too, because then I started listening to opera. I had only ever listened to light opera, like the Phantom of the Opera or Cats, or I actually don't think Cats is a light (laughs) opera. That would be a musical, but let's say um, Les Mis. I loved those musicals. This film sort of introduced me to that next step and, you know, singing. And I, I remember I have visual memories of me at 12 or 13 years old sitting with the very first CD I ever owned, which was Kiri Takano singing Puccini and Verdi. And looking at the little booklet, which had all of the lyrics in it, and it had the Italian on the left side and it had the English translation on the right side. And I was listening to her sing these same songs from the film A Room with a View and, and others trying to follow along on the Italian and trying to understand and trying to see what, where the pronunciation was. And I have another memory of me, this is really embarrassing, having tried to memorize the recitative. If you don't know what recitative is, it's the sing-songy parts of, let's say, Mozart operas and operas from that period that come between the important scenes. It's not like you're singing an aria. It's just, you know, sing-songy and it's very wordy. There's a lot of words in there. And I memorized all of the recitative from The Marriage of Figaro. On the one hand, it was because I loved the music. But on the other hand, it was because then I would speak the words without singing and pretend that I was able to speak Italian. And I did this when I was 17 years old, when I was on vacation, (laughs) summer vacation. And I used to just rattle off Italian and pretend that I was speaking to my Italian boyfriend. (laughs) So, yeah, that's embarrassing. But, but yeah, it's so clever. <laughs> well, you see where it led me. <laughs> where else could it have led me? Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. Would your mother be uh, worried that all of this opera training was just an excuse to get you to Italy since you didn't become an opera singer? No, I don't think she would think it was an excuse because she knows how much I adored opera and how hard I worked. Very dedicated for over a decade. But I, I would, she would never say this because she's very supportive of me. But I know that she's disappointed, that I didn't make more of a go of it, that I didn't put myself out there a little more. And I have to admit, sometimes I regret that too. We cannot know our path. Just like who knows why this door had to close for you, for your past job. You know, who you can't know right now why. But I know that I was supposed to come here 
this is cue the like you know full house music i know that i was supposed to come here this sounds so cheesy but i know that i was destined to come here and i was talking to one of my older half sisters and i was very serious with my boyfriend at the time who i'm now married to and i was talking to her about it and she said oh so you're not singing anymore you know what you're not doing that you know kind of had a similar conversation with her as I've had having right now and I said something about Claudio and she said well that's why that clearly that's the reason and I'm not going to say that he's the only reason although he's a huge part of my life but I don't think that the person that you marry is the end all and be all of your life of course there's much more but I do think that in a sense I was destined to come here because I was destined to meet him and I think becoming a writer too I, I didn't start out thinking that I would be a writer but coming here inspired me so much all of my writing is inspired by Italy so if I hadn't come here I don't know if I would have found this path it's a convoluted path and everyone's life is we can't always know why we do things but I think everything happens for a reason I'm a romantic it is that lesson of sometimes you just have to let go of the rope and see what happens on the other side that's very much where I'll be standing when I leave here is what's going to happen on the other side. I guess we'll have to see. We'll have to follow your your voyage. I'm glad that I made the leap, that I took the interlude, because I'm not a bold person. I'm not a person that would move off to Italy. Clearly Normally. you are. Well, I know, I've become. But that's the thing. I think it's this has very much altered me. I was a person who played it safe, and I don't feel like I'm going to be that way as much anymore. One last little thing on the same note as what you were saying, letting go of the rope. When I moved here, I wasn't leaving anything behind. So it was easier for me, actually. Much easier, in a sense, than it has been for you. My husband and I sometimes talk about leaving Rome. And it scares me so much more than the thought of leaving America ever scared me. And it's not my home country, so it's weird. But I actually admire you and am inspired by you because you did something when you had this great career and you had this set course that you were on and this great job. I'm not saying I have a job that good here, but I do have this sort of sense of, oh my gosh, if I leave, I'm going to lose this job. But I have to remember that sometimes you just have to let go. Well, you have to take your own advice that you gave me at the beginning, which is sometimes a door closes so that something bigger can happen. I know, it's so easy to say. I know, it's so much harder to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Oh, well, we should probably leave it there. On this inspirational note, or scary note, depending on who you are and what you're thinking about your own life, I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. This is The Bittersweet Life. Join us again. <laughs>